I um, am the co-editor of Octavia's Brood Science Fiction Stories from Social Justice Movements, which is, a, which is a collection that came out last March. And it includes 20 short stories that are fantastical. We call them science fiction for shorthand. If you're like a hardcore nerd, you're like, do not use science fiction as a bucket term because that is not science fiction. That's technically magical realism. I feel you if that's what's happening for you right now. It's cool, it's, we'll talk more about it. Um, but uh, 20 fantastical science fiction stories written by organizers, activists, and change makers. And it also includes two essays. And so this is a project myself and my co-editor, Adrienne Marie Brown, uh, worked on for over five years. And we were both separately doing work around science fiction and social change and decided to unite like one twins activate and um, kind of put together this anthology um, this is the table of contents and so <clears throat> um, even though we were very lucky to get a few um, well-known science fiction writers who are also folks engaged in social change and as part of our collection the vast majority of writers had never written fiction let alone science fiction um, so, you know, we were very lucky to get uh, Terry Bisson, who agreed to let us reprint his seminal work, fi uh, a section of it, Fire on the Mountain, uh, which the, the basic premise of Fire on the Mountain is what if John's Brown, John Brown's rebellion against slavery in 1859 at Harper's Ferry had been successful? And so it's set in 1959. It's the, you know, centennial celebration of the founding of a black nation in, in the southern states. And that black nation is just about to put the first person on the moon in 1959. So the first person in this book to walk on the moon was black. I was like, that's right, black moon. Um, so I read that book once a year because it, it gives me hope, <laughs> it gives me life. Um, we were incredibly lucky to get Tanana Reeve Du, who is a phenomenal black horror writer. She submitted a, an essay that she's written about Octavia Butler, who the collection is named for. We'll definitely talk more about Octavia and actually hear a little bit of her own words. Um, but she, her essay, The Only Lasting Truth, is about Octavia Butler and social change themes in her writing and in how, to, how she moved through the world. And you may notice there's a name, LeVar Burton. Maybe you've heard of him uh, from from such, I feel like Troy McClure, you may know him from such movies as um, uh, Star Trek, The Next Generation, Reading Rainbow, Roots, um, just awesomeness. So we reached out to him and asked him if he would be open to us reprinting a section of his book, Aftermath. A lot of people don't know he wrote a book. He did, it's amazing, you should read it. It's awesome. It came out in 1996, and he was like, guess what? We have a black president. And I was like, LeVar Burton, you could add profit to your list. Uh, <laughs> so we just reached out to him on social media, and, and it, we were like, it's just a shot in the dark, but hey, why not? Why not dream big? Uh, dream impossible dreams. And in less than an hour, he wrote back and said, I would be most pleased. So, Because he's classy, too, you guys. Um, so, you know, these are, these are some of the folks that we have who, have who have been writing science fiction as well as engaged in social change. But as I said, the majority of the contributors had never written fiction, let alone science fiction. I keep like coming here to push it, but I don't need to push it because I've got this exciting clicker. There's just a lot happening right now. Uh, so I wanted to, um, to play uh, a, a series of short videos. We, we did a crowdfunding campaign, and we did a series of videos of the uh, authors talking about their work. And so I've spliced some of those together so we can just kind of hear them talk about their own work. So my sci-fi story is, is the kind that I've, I've wanted to read from Ethiopia for a long time. I, I hope it's the kind of thing that will inspire other Ethiopian writers and African writers to both um, reclaim history that's been buried while at the same time imagining different futures. So I tried to do both in the story. Yeah, so it's inspired by this picture, which is the St. Georgis Church in Mavi Bella. And 
it kind of looks like a spaceport to me. So I reimagined um, this temple as a spaceport. And I reimagined the life of Lali Bella, and he's a time traveler. And I talk about kind of how he time travels, how they had all these technological advancements like several centuries ago. I um, have been thinking a lot about and trying to process my, like an emotional reaction to the hunger strikes in Guantanamo and like what it means to have been imprisoning people without charge, without reason for so long. And that they are, you know, that if it's not freedom, it's I'm going to starve to death. And what that means, and I think that it's very hard for me to process that that reality and that feeling so much so powerless around it. So in my mind, I have created um, an archipelago with island prison. What's happening with Guantanamo is that there is history and story that's untold and that there is so much power in story and really long memory and that my dad used to call the long memory the most dangerous idea in America. And that resonates with me around these current issues of like, if people knew the long memory, if they knew the full history, they would know that this is not okay and this is wrong. And so exploring that through a fictional fantasy world is where I'm going. Basically a short story where it's, you know, my granddaughter, who's also a psychic intuitive abuse survivor organizer, um, is living in the apocalypse in like the flooded remains of the San Francisco Bay Area. and. All these grandchildren of those of us who are doing somatics in 2013 have honed their psychic abilities and are using it to like interact with and heal planetary existence. That is the meaning of Star Wars. We were rebels. We are empire. And like all rebellious children, we were but going through a phase. We're getting ready for adulthood after we sowed a few wild oats. Once grown, we put on our imperial uniform and bow to the empire. It is your destiny, right? Unless, from somewhere, maybe on the Enterprise, this is Mumia Abu-Jamal. My story is about, it's about time travel through intellectual practice. It's like, do we time travel through our reading, through our writing? through our thinking, are we actually receiving messages from and sending messages to people who lived in different generations through the way we use language? So that's just a little bit from the writers about their stories. And, <clears throat> you know, when we reached out to many of these writers, their, their response was, I think you might have sent this to the wrong person in your email, because I don't write science fiction, so you might want to resend it to the right person. Um, and we were like, we do have the right person. We want you. Because we strongly believe that all organizing is science fiction. And therefore, all organizers are sci-fi creators. So every time we imagine a world without capitalism, a world without borders, a world without prisons, a world without homophobia or transphobia, that's science fiction. Because we've never seen that world but we actually can't build something if we can't imagine it. And so we feel that all organizing is science fiction, and we also believe that movements for social change absolutely need fantastical spaces like science fiction that not only allow us to throw out everything we're told is realistic and possible, but demand that we do that. That we stop starting with the, the stop starting, that was a weird, <laughs> we start stopping. Um, that we don't start with the question, what is a realistic win that we can eke out of the system, but that we start with the question, what is the kind of world we want to live in, and then how do we build that world into existence? And so I wanted to share a clip from Ursula Le Guin. How many folks know Ursula Le Guin? Okay. Well done, Portland. Well, well, we'll talk a little more about her work uh, later, but she just gave this amazing uh, speech at the National Book Awards in 2014. I think she got it's like a Lifetime Achievement Award or whatever, whatever classy term they call it. Um, and she kind of, well, in this clip she doesn't go in so much, but if you watch the whole thing, like she goes in on them in her very nice way where she's like, y'all are messing up, but uh, I'm just gonna play this clip. 
I think hard times are coming when we will be wanting the voices of writers who can see alternatives to how we live now and can see through our fear-stricken society and its obsessive technologies to other ways of being and even imagine some real grounds for hope. We will need writers who can remember freedom. Poets, visionaries, the realists of a larger reality. <laughs> Books, you know, they're, they're not just commodities. The profit motive is often in conflict with the aims of art. We live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. So did the divine right of kings. <laughs> Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. Resistance and change often begin in art and very often in our art, the art of words. So I just, I just love it. I was like, she pulled out the divine right of kings, what? She's like, you guys, remember that time in the, you know, in the Middle Ages where Europe couldn't imagine a different system of existence other than the kings getting to do whatever they wanted because, you know, they were kings and God said so? No, you don't remember that? That's right, because we tore that down. So awesome. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, again, I love, I love that she says not only do we need writers who can imagine alternatives, but we need writers who can also remember freedom and that those go together, right? We often hear this narrative, which is a very, you know, white Western, you know, technocratic, patriarchal narrative of ever going forward to greatness, right? We're ever progressing in this linear fashion away from savagery towards civilization, right? And in science fiction towards singularity where we and machines just become one whatever but <clears throat> um you know, I think that we see amongst marginalized and oppressed folks that the reality is actually more, you know, um, I'm not going to go off on my time travel rant right now because I kind of want to, but I'm going to rein it in. We could do that later if you all want. Um, but time is not linear, right? And so being able to go back and get what we've lost is incredibly important. There's a symbol in the, uh, an Indinkra symbol, uh, which is West African culture, and it's called Sankofa. And there are actually two versions of it. Um, one looks kind of like a heart, and the other looks like a bird that's moving forward, but its head is facing backwards, and it has, it has a seed in its mouth. And the Sankofa means go back and get what you lost, right? And so I feel like it's this foundational idea of, of time travel, of saying we have the power to transcend all you know, man-made barriers, including the, this notion of time that we've been given. So I am saying science fiction a lot, but we know that all science fiction doesn't actually help us imagine new just worlds, right? Except maybe as cautionary tales, like, dear God, don't do that. Um, you know, that science fiction, there's a reason that the original Star Trek series was sold as a wagon train to the stars, right? That science fiction and Westerns actually have a lot in common, right? Again, this notion of going into the vast unknown, the wilderness, you know, braving unknown hardships, encountering savages, you know, sub doing them, dominating them, and colonizing, right? That's often the narrative we get in space and in Westerns. And so, you know, uh, so many of these big blockbuster movies, the plot is there's that one white, straight, cis dude, right, who's military usually, or ex-military, and he drinks a lot because his life has been hard, you guys. And he's, he's in his little space suit, you know. And I feel like Hollywood has the one space suit that they just pass around. They're like, hey, the Martian, are you guys done with the space suit yet? No? All right, we'll wait. It's cool. Uh, but, you know, he's like, he's like, hey, you guys, I'm, I'm the white dude. I got this. I'm going to blow up a lot of stuff, 
and then it's gonna be cool. That's what I do, right? And the rest of us are completely powerless. We're just like, oh, I hope he blows up everything. Uh, <laughs> so that, that doesn't help us imagine new just worlds, right? And I'm not saying you can't watch those movies, I'm just saying um, in terms of, you know, uh, science fiction that actually helps us imagine better worlds, uh, we wanted to differentiate a little bit. So I came up with the term visionary fiction, and the definition of visionary fiction is that it is fantastical stories that help us understand current power inequalities and imagine ways to build new just worlds into the future. Um, and so we also came up with it for a bucket term so that I, we didn't argue with our nerds about, well, is this technically science fiction? Is it? Is it science fiction? Is it magical realism? Is it alternative timeline? We're like, sweetie, stop, stop it. Um, so it's a bucket term. It means sci-fi, speculative fiction, fantasy, magical realism, alternative timeline, horror. Basically, if it's weird and it changes the world, that's us, right? And we came up with some, some principles of, uh, of visionary fiction. So visionary fiction is conscious of identity and intersecting identities, right? So, you know, in, again, in the mainstream sci-fi movies, the story is all about this white man and his journey, and everyone else is there just to prop him up, right? So there's the white woman, and her job is to just look real pretty, just look real pretty all the time, and squeeze out a couple tears at the right moment, right? They're the people of color, and Really, their job is to help along this white man's journey and usually die, right? Which we know. Um, and the reason they can die is because they're not real characters. They're actually more props, right? They are tools to be used to further this, you know, white supremacist patriarchal narrative. And so, you know, for us, we say, you know, no to all of that. We actually create <coughs> characters that are full human beings. We uh, especially center those folks who have been marginalized and who live at the intersections of identity because we realize that when we center those folks who live at the intersections of oppression, that's actually when we begin to see what true liberation looks like. And so there's a, one story in the collection, well, there are many stories in the collection, basically they all talk about that, but this uh, one story I think illustrates it really powerfully, it's called Hollow by Mia Mingus, and it's set in a world where normatively abled people call themselves the perfects and decide to eradicate the unperfects who are folks who are uh, differently abled or disabled. And they, they basically attempt to commit genocide on the unperfects. They end up shoving them on this <coughs> floating asteroid and sending them away and being like, y'all go there and just die because we know you can't live without us. You depend upon us for life. We're cutting it off. You will die. And instead, what the ups, because unperfects, so they call themselves ups, because it's like on top. Uh, what the ups do is build this beautiful visionary society where everyone's needs are met and where when you're centering especially you know in the story you know queer and trans differently abled people of color we actually see that the society opens up and addresses everyone's needs and everyone's identity <clears throat> so that's you know that's just one example of that so visionary fiction is not utopian and it's actually not dystopian and we'll talk a little bit more about that but we actually don't think either of those terms are super helpful in the context of talking about using science fiction to change the world. So instead, we say that visionary fiction is realistic and hard, but it's hopeful. It's hopeful that change can happen if, it, if uh, we embody principles. If change comes from the bottom up, not the top down, if change is collective, if it's decentralized, if it's anti-capitalist, if it is relational, that it recognizes that the, the foundation of everything is the connections we have as human beings and honors that. And lastly, visionary fiction isn't neutral and it doesn't purport to be neutral. My co-editor, Adrian, always says that all art either advances or regress regresses justice, right? And I think that that's an incredibly helpful frame because if you are not aware and conscious of the kind of framework you are perpetuating in your art, then most likely you are perpetuating the dominant, dominant 
ideology, which is is repressive, right? That white dude and his suit. Uh, so with us, we are very consciously choosing to advance justice through our art. Um, so <clears throat> to just talk a little bit more about this utopia dystopia split uh, or or reconnecting, actually. So, you know, we, we feel like there are a number of problems around this concept of utopia and dystopia. One of them is that um, there, there are no true utopias in the, the mainstream way that we know the word utopia. We'll actually talk more about the word in a little bit. But, you know, this kind of mainstream idea where utopia is this perfect society where everything has been solved and there are no issues, you know, and we all sit around on clouds playing lutes. Like, that's all I said. We're all dead, apparently. That's what it is. We're all dead, because that's the only time we're going to get there. <laughs> um, so we, we feel like there are no true utopias in that sense, because human beings are messy, right? And, and we're going to be engaged in a continual process of reimagining ourselves and the future. But we also feel like there's no true dystopia as long as there's one human being who can hope, who can imagine something different, right? Um, and so, you know, we, we really want to break that dichotomy. I think another piece that's incredibly important for us is to ask the question, utopia, utopia for whom, right? And I just wanted to play uh, a little bit of the trailer from the film Elysium, which came out in 2013, because I think it helps illustrate that well. Ah, oh, hello, madam. So I feel like, you know, not necessarily advocating if you haven't seen Elysium for you to go watch it. I'm not saying don't watch it either. I'm just saying. <clears throat> That's your choice. <laughs> but I, I feel like that that concept was is a really powerful one, and it, it explains it very clearly, right? That we have to ask a perfect world for who, because usually there isn't a perfect world that can encompass all of us. And so if some folks are living in perfection, then it is at the expense of, of other folks. Um, and so this relates directly to the work I do around Oregon black history, because Oregon as a state was founded as a racist white utopia, right? Oregon as a, as a state, even when it, before a state, as a territory, was, was this science fiction dream of white folks for them to come and build the kind of white society they dreamed about, away from the ills of the day, which they construed to mean the presence of people of color. And so they worked to clear out indigenous folks whose land it was after stealing it and giving it away for free to white folks. And they specifically outlawed slavery, but also banned black folks from living in Oregon. And the first exclusionary law included the lash law that said that black people would be publicly whipped up to 39 lashes every six months until we left Oregon, right? So Oregon was both anti-slavery and anti-black, and it was anti-slavery not because of issues of freedom and justice, it was anti-slavery because it didn't want people bringing enslaved black folks to Oregon, right? They didn't want any black folks here. <clears throat> and so I think it's, you know, I think it's incredibly important to recognize that and to recognize that we are living in, you know, in the, in, in the aftermath of this white racist utopian dream of these white folks who came and founded Oregon. So this is not something that is, you know, is, is just in the, you know, the world of nerds and, oh, that's interesting, but it has no bearing on real life. This is how this manifests in real life. And so, 
obviously this was the, the, the perfect dream for white folks, uh, for certain white folks, but was a living nightmare for folks of color. I think the, um, the other thing that's you know, really important about challenging the utopia and dystopia divide is that there, we, are, we have utopias, utopias and dystopias happening right now, right, by common conception. There are people who are leading utopian lives, just like in Elysium, and there are folks who are living daily hells, dystopias every single day. And often they live very close to each other, right, and that, that gap is widening. Because of, uh, because of capitalism. And so I think, you know, it's, I think it's interesting to see all of these dystopic films that have been coming out, right? Hunger Games, Mad Max, like just basically every science fiction film is this dystopic future. And often what it is, is white folks' nightmares of having to live the way people of color live every single day, right? So like the, the premise of movies, oh my God, we have no water. This is terrible. This is a dystopia, right? Meanwhile, brown people around the world are like, we've been living that way for decades, for centuries in some cases. There are people right now, as we know from the news, in Flint, Michigan, who don't have access to water that won't kill them. They are, you know, on, on the Navajo Nation, that water is actually even dirtier than the water in Flint, Michigan. It's even more toxic, right? But that's just business as usual. But when all white folks have to live under the conditions that people of color live under every day, that's when, that's when it becomes a dystopia. Otherwise, it's just business as usual. And so I think that it's really important to, to, to be clear about that, because otherwise, I think that science fiction has the um, danger of desensitizing us to the daily oppressions that happen you know, in this country and around this world constantly. And I think one example that really stood out to me so starkly was when uh, black youth were engaged in, uh, you know, protests and uprisings and standing against tanks and, uh, you know, military-grade weapons in Ferguson to protest the murder of Mike Brown by a white police officer, the Mockingjay, the third part one, right, because they're like, oh, we have to have two parts <laughs> to everything. Even if it was a two-page story, we're going to make it a two-parter. It's cool. Uh, so the second, the first part of Mockingjay, the Hunger Games trilogy, was in the theaters, right? And um, spoiler alert, if you have not read or seen it, you're a little late. Um, <laughs> you can maybe block your ears and like sing the theme to Star Trek so you can't hear me <laughs> for the next few seconds. Uh, so in Mockingjay, there's, there's an uprising, right? There's a rebellion. The districts are revolting against the capital, which is, you know, coincidentally enough, the seat of capitalism um, and the one that is keeping them all oppressed. And there's a scene where the, the folks who are uprising destroy a dam, right, to knock out the power to the capital, to basically kill the capital. And white folks went wild, y'all, in those theaters. I don't know if you saw, but the one I was in, who were like, yeah, take it down, right? And I was like, whoa, you guys, <laughs> calm down, right? But these are the same folks who walk out of that theater and say, well, you know, if these black folks would just use appropriate methods for protest, then we could actually have a dialogue. Um, but you know, they're looting, why are they burning down their own neighborhood, blah, 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 right? And I'm like, I'm sorry, were you five seconds ago not cheering when they blew up a dam <laughs> and knocked out the power, which affects all of their communities as well, right? Like, why are, you, why are you knocking out the power of your own communities, districts, right? Maybe if the Mockingjay had just engaged in reasonable rebellion, the capital would have been able to negotiate with them, right? Like, they would have listened, just appeal to the conscience of the capital. I'm, <laughs> this is my rant, y'all, but so, but I think that this is the situation we get into if we aren't 
clear about the ways that dystopias exist for people of color every day, because again, then white folks get desensitized to the suffering of, of people of color, and in this case, end up having more empathy and connection to fictional white people than they do to real black folks who were dying in the street, right? And this is part of the reason why I think science fiction is incredibly, is incredibly important. So I just wanted to talk really quickly about the term utopia because, um, because I, the way that we use it is actually incorrect, right? It's it, it, common practice is that it's this perfect society, right, as we talked about where everything has been solved. But the first time the word was used <clears throat> was in 1516 for Thomas More's book. He made up the word, actually, out of Latin. And, you know, obviously, I don't have a time machine. If I did, that would be awesome, you guys. Uh, I would go so many places. I'm like, would it be Bill and Ted's time machine? Or would it, it doesn't matter. I'll think about that later. Um, but you know, uh, you can't, we can't go back in time and know what Thomas More was thinking when he wrote this. But the, the title itself, the word utopia itself, gives us very clear indications. So utopia in Latin means both good place and no place, right? So from the very beginning, the question is, what, what is that? But Thomas More, what does that actually mean? <laughs> like, are you saying utopias are impossible? You know, are you saying that, um, that, you know, utopia doesn't exist right now and we have to strive for it, right? And so, so in the story, he spends the first half critiquing critiquing the society of his day in the 1500s in England, right? He's um, critiquing kings fighting wars for profit, which kill, you know, uh, poor folks. He's critiquing especially uh, capital punishment for theft. And then the, the narrator ends up going to this, this island called Utopia, and it is this uh, pagan uh, communist nation state, right? And, um, you know, they, uh, they share everything communally. Uh, everyone, you know, has access to, to health care, to food, um, education. Uh, women are allowed to serve in the military. They're also uh, allowed to bring legal action against their husbands for intimate violence, right? In 1516, y'all, um, so, you know, I was like, utopia, I want to go there. But they also have slaves, right? They also are at war with other folks. They also um, <laughs> have, uh, if uh, premarital sex is punished by a lifetime of celibacy, so... Maybe I don't want to go there. But, um, you know, so, so f I think from the very beginning, it showed the, the, the actual utopia shows us the complexities of humanity and shows us that whether Michael, or Michael Moore, <laughs> whether Michael Moore in 1516, <laughs> oh, he's been around a while, but not that long again, whether Thomas More was, you know, saying, you know, utopia is a perfect society, utopia is a terrible society, utopia is a mixed society of good and bad, right? I think what we can pull out from that is that there, you know, that, that there is no kind of um, perfect society that we are moving to achieve. And I think that when we think that way in movements for social change, we have set ourselves up to to, to fail, right? That we, ha we not only have to do everything perfect, everything has to go perfectly, and then we, if we do that right, we will reach this perfect end game. And none of those things are actually true. And I think that um, a lot of disillusionment with organizing for social justice comes from these, these fa false ideas. So I just wanted to highlight two uh, societies that could be considered utopian, um, but uh, show the complexities of it. I think show it in a way where it is visionary fiction and where it's useful. Has anyone read Woman on the Edge of Time? Okay. It's awesome, you guys. I found this book when I was 15 at a used bookstore, and I was like, whoa, whoa. I couldn't even get words out. It was so good. So in it, uh, a woman from modern time in 1976 ends up traveling to a futuristic society 
and she's, um, you know, this, they, they live communally, um, everyone in, involves themselves in agriculture, um, you know, childcare is collective. They also did not use gendered pronouns, they, they said per, so they were like, oh, per left per's bag. And at 15, I was like, what? This is possible? Why is everyone not doing this, right? And I tried to bring it to my high school, didn't work great. I was like, oh, Pearl left Pearl's bag. And people were like, what, are you a cat? What are you doing right now? You guys need to read this book. Um, and there, you know, there's this, there's this thing which I talk about and sometimes folks are like, that's a little frivolous. And I'm like, that's exactly the point that you think it's frivolous. So one of the things that I love in the book is that they, um, they still have their own style and fashion and creativity in terms of, um, you know, what they wear, what they create. I think that too often when we see futuristic communal societies, and this is amazing capitalist propaganda, everyone is wearing the same gray blue uniform right everyone has the same haircut they are marching in line right it's the giver literally they live in gray in black and white they have no color right uh, yeah you can have communal society but you will give up everything for it You're like, oh um, that, you know, so I love that in this book that doesn't happen, that people live communally and collectively and, and retain their individuality. And one of the ways they do that is that they make flimsies. And so these are, these are fabulous, fantastical outfits made out of algae that are one-time uses. So they make them, they wear them to their celebrations, and then they recycle them and put them in the food the next day. And then they eat their fashion. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I wish I could be like, you guys, you should come over later, you know, huh? Snack. Uh, <laughs> and the other thing they have is they have a lending library for, for, for art, for, um, for, you know, for expensive dress or things that would be expensive dresses, jewelry, sculpture, right? So that you can, like in a library, you can go and check it out for a couple weeks. So you could go to the library and say, oh my gosh, yeah, obviously I wanna have that Basquiat painting. Dude, can I renew too? How, long, how many times can I renew? <laughs> and then you can hang it, you know, on your wall. And so I just, I love that, that communal um, nature of, of beautiful, creative things that allow us to be individuals and recognizing that that actually makes all, the, the whole stronger rather than weaker. Um, but the, the, again, the great thing about this book is that it's not a perfect society. They're actually still at war fighting against folks who re wanna reinstitute you know, the pre-revolutionary politics and they have the death penalty. And when the main character finds that out, she's really horrified and she's like, y'all are so advanced, why would you do this? And the character who's showing her around says, we don't think it's the right thing, we just think it's the expedient thing. You know, and says, this is something we're struggling with. How do we deal with this? How do we, how do we move forward? So I love that Marge Piercy gave us this image of these politics that a lot of us talk about in practice. Oh, that's what it might look like. But also was like, and there will still be work to do, y'all. Like, it's not done. And think, speaking of the concept of there'll still be work to do, um, how many folks have read The, the Dispossessed? Um, so the subtitle, obviously, is what we're talking about, an ambiguous utopia. <clears throat> so it's set in uh, a future where the capitalists and the anarchists have gone to war, and basically as a peace treaty, the capitalists have given the anarchists this moon. And they're like, go, go build your little anarchist thing over there, you do you boo, we'll do us, it's cool. So it's set on the, on the, acid, on the, the moon, Anaris, and it's set several, several generations in the future, so they were like, we won, we built our perfect society, we built our you know, non-hierarchical mutual aid society. This is awesome, now we just live in perfection forever. Utopia. And it takes place several generations later and what the main character Shevik begins to realize is that those very systems of oppression that they had fought so hard against were reinstituting themselves in these insidious ways within their anarchistic society, right? And he was like, oh, Yes, right, 
change is not a destination, it's a process, and we will continually be engaged in re-envisioning, moving forward, uh, doing that work. So I think someone who is amazing at offering us realistic and hard, but also hopeful, is Octavia Butler. Um, and Octavia Butler was a black, how many folks know Octavia Butler? Oh, I like that there were more hands there. So Octavia Butler was a black feminist science fiction writer, visionary, um, treasure. She won the MacArthur Genius Award, um, and unfortunately she passed away in 2006. But, you know, she was someone who really, I think, um, embodied and in fact, in some ways, uh, in some cases, taught us these principles of visionary fiction that Adrian and I worked to develop. And in all of her books, you know, her main characters are, are the marginalized folks. Almost all of her main characters are young black women, right, who are dealing with ability access and um, are dealing with uh, mental health realities, are dealing with, um, you know, sexual identity, gender identity, all within the context of, of course, aliens and vampires and mutants because um, it's sci-fi. And, you know, I think more than just the identity, which is very important, right? It's very important for us to see reflections of ourselves. And I think Avery Brooks, uh, who played Ca Captain Sisko on Star Trek Deep Space Nine, we can also talk about why Star Trek Deep Space Nine is the best Star Trek that's ever been made. And we might, we could have some nerd baits about it. Nerd debates, nerd baits. Um, but, you know, he, uh, he had this amazing quote because he's this, you know, he's this black man on the show and he fought to not just be black, but to have a cultural context. Uh, he fought with the writers and the producers for him to date a black woman on the show, right? He was like, I want my love interest to be a black woman. I want a black woman on the show, right? He's like, I want to have a cultural context, right? I want to have family for my character. I don't want him to just be, you know, the same as everyone else, just, you know, painted brown. The same mold, just a different plastic color. And, you know, he, he had this great interview where he said, I did that because children of color need to be able to see themselves whole eons hence, right? And I was like, Thank you, Avery Brooks. Because, you know, sometimes you're like, did you know what you were doing? And he was like, oh, I knew, and it was hard. <laughs> you're welcome. I'm going to go take a nap. <laughs> like, um, So, you know, so I think one of the things about Octavia is she absolutely shows us ourselves in these in these. Uh, stories and, and centers it around uh, people of color, around folks who have been marginalized, but she keeps to these principles and values, right? She's like, it's not enough just to get brown folks in there. We have to talk about what is the kind of change that we want, right? And that her characters are struggling to build societies, you know, that as we talked about with visionary fiction, embody, you know, collective, decentralized, non-hierarchical communities, and that that's really, really hard when that's all we've known, you know, to try and institute something else, especially in the midst of, you know, alien takeovers or vampire wars, you know, or the collapse of modern society, which is when they build it. But that gives me some hope, because I'm like, you know, these folks can build this with aliens taking over the, the earth. Like, we could do this now, right? Like, we could do this like that, right? Um... So uh, I'm not going to play this because the audio is really low and I don't think we'll be able to hear it. But um, these, these are, I just have two clips um, from interviews that Octavia Butler did. So if you want to look at them on your own, I would strongly encourage that. Um, the, she did an interview with Charlie Rose and then she, did, she was interviewed in a BBC documentary, Black Sci-Fi, that came out in 1992. And both of them are on YouTube in their entirety. So you can check them out yourselves. Um, but I just wanted to, to wrap up with uh, some of the ways that we are trying to bring this uh, 
kind of out of just the realm of imagination and into the realm of reality. Because for Adrian and myself, it wasn't enough just to, not just to, like, my Octavia's Brood isn't a just, but we wanted to not only put out Octavia's Brood and these stories, these 20 stories, these two essays that we thought were incredible, we wanted to create spaces for folks to ideate together, to dream together, to imagine together. We wanted to create spaces where we could practice those new worlds and those new values, because we don't get enough spaces to practice, right? We get many spaces where we need to be perfect and where we can't make a mistake. And I think one really powerful thing about science fiction is that, you know, Oftentimes it feels uh, a little less high pressure and a little more fun, and so folks can feel like they could take risks, they can think of new ideas, they can try and push the boundaries um, without feeling like, oh, folks are gonna be like, oh, that's not the correct way to say it. That was problematic, right? Oh, problematic. <laughs> Saying problematic, I think, is problematic. Right? I'm like, what does that mean? That just means, like, you just messed up, and I'm really smart, and I saw it, right? And I'm letting you know. I'm not going to tell you why you messed up. I'm just going to tell you messed up, right? And I'm like, could you just say what, what the problem is? Uh, back to my point. <laughs> so Adrian developed Octavia Butler Emergent Strategy Sessions, where folks use the readings uh, of uh, the writings and readings of Octavia Butler and pull out sessions and lessons that they can use for their organizing work. And folks have been creating tools around this, so I wanted to share these resources with you if you are interested in learning more or running these workshops in your own communities, because our goal is not to kind of hoard it and be like, no, you have to bring us out, right? Our goal is we want everyone to be dreaming. My goal, my dream would be that every, you know, organizing meeting ends with visioning sessions of saying, what's the world we want 100 years in the future? What is this issue going to look like 100 years in the future? What are new issues that, that are going to come up, and how can we imagine overcoming them as well? So uh, the Octavia Butler Emergent Strategy the strategic reader was created by Adrian and Alexis, who is also a contributor to Octavia's Brood. The transformative justice strategic sci-fi reader looks at um, how can we use science fiction to imagine mechanisms to keep our communities whole and safe and accountable without prisons and police, right? And I think that this is, this, we, I think that um, prison abolition, uh, tearing down all prisons um, and replacing them with community-based um, mechanisms for addressing harm is where science fiction comes into play, right? Because we cannot imagine, we've been so conditioned, we're like, wait, no, I'm sorry. I just, my brain couldn't even take in what you said. No prisons, right? Rather than saying, oh, right, prisons are actually a fairly new creation, and we existed before prisons, and there are folks who have been doing this work forever, so I think science fiction is kind of a perfect place to explore that. Um, my new book, as uh, Elliot talked about, Angels with Dirty Faces, Three Stories of Crime, Prison, and Redemption, is, um, is my attempt, and it's nonfiction, to to humanize those folks who have done harm. I think it's really easy to dehumanize people who have done serious harm. Um, but how do we hold folks as humanity while we still absolutely hold them accountable for the harm that's been done? Um, and so my, my book is trying to, trying to do that. So we can, I feel like we need, to, we need to humanize folks before we can even have a conversation about prison abolition. Um, but this, this uh, the transformative justice strategic sci-fi reader, three out of the four folks who made it are in Octavia's brood. And then Adrian created the emergent strategy handbook, which is the nuts and bolts. If you wanna do an emergent strategy session, you know, here are the tools you might need, the supplies, here's how you could structure it, right? So if you are interested in doing it yourself, um, these are some resources for you to do that. So we do uh, a collective sci-fi writing and visioning workshop where folks pick issues that they want to focus on and then they create uh, fantastical worlds where they can explore those issues through a visionary fiction lens. 
And I think one of the really amazing, powerful things um, is Black Lives Matter put out a call um, a few months ago for people to submit writings in response to the prompt in a world where black lives matter, I imagine, right? And you know, this is a visionary fiction prompt, right? And you know, Adrian really talks about this. Even when we say Black Lives Matter, that's science fiction. Right? It's not science fiction to Black folks. It's not science fiction to our allies. We know our lives have always mattered. But in mainstream society, Black lives have never mattered except as tools and as capital. And so, to say Black lives matter, I feel like is dreaming that future and pulling it into reality and saying we will reshape the entire world if necessary to make this everyone's lived reality. And the last piece I just want to talk about is a sci-fi and organizing workshop that we do because uh, it's kind of the nerdiest thing ever where we take existing uh, science fiction worlds and s groups embody the marginalized folks within those worlds, create a organizing goal, and then develop direct action tactics to achieve that goal. So you end up thi with things like stormtroopers staging general strikes to <laughs> stand in, in solidarity with the Rebel Alliance. Uh, I made this necklace myself for when I went to see The Force Awakens because I dressed as Leia. Uh, yes, that happened. Uh, but I dressed as, as Black Leia, or as I like to call her, Blea. So, <laughs> uh, so I had the Afro puffs. And I was like, you know, Le Princess Leia, God bless, but she doesn't accessorize well, right? She just had that little belt sometimes. So I was like, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to bring it, um, Leia, no offense, but Blea needs to do it her own way. Uh, <laughs> back to the point. So, um, you know, you have uh, flying monkeys from Wizard of Oz demanding the right to return because they've been stolen from their homeland, right? Uh, I think the best one was, uh, there was a Willy Wonka in the chocolate Chocolate Factory group, not Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. They were very clear about that. And so they, you know, they were like, we, um, you know, we want to unionize. We want paid leave. Where the, obviously the Oompa Loompas. I, I feel like, you know, that's. And they're like, you know, we don't even get sick days. We got to work around these sick kids with this chocolate all day. And they're like, we're locking Willy Wonka out of the factory until he meets our demands and allows us to unionize. And I was like, that is amazing. So a lot of people in town like chocolate, right? You saw those kids with those golden tickets, all right? So you are about to deprive them of their chocolate. How are you going to create direct action tactics to spread the word so that they understand why they can't have any chocolate? And they were like, oh, that's a good point. Okay. And so I was like, great. I walk away. And I hear the best thing I've ever heard in any workshop. Flash mobs! Oompa Loompas are perfectly built for flash mobs! <laughs> I was like, good night. <laughs> Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a really fun exercise and it allows folks to explore different uh, possibilities and kind of expand beyond the realm of the tactics that folks use again and again and again and think about what is actually the most effective tactic for our organizing goal here. So I'm going to stop there and I would love to open it up for questions, for comments, for nerd baits, for recommendations of nerdiness. Um, and we have a microphone, so you will need to wait till the microphone comes to you. Really? Okay. I'll go through. Hi, I'm just curious how, and I'll, I'll butcher his name, uh, Tundi Ulanarian, how, how he got involved, how he got involved. I love his music, but uh, would love to know that story. Yeah, Tunde Alaniran is uh, an amazing musician. Everyone should get his album, Transgressor. I feel like it is, <clears throat> I was like, this is visionary fiction like soundtrack happening right here. Um, Tunde is actually a really, really close friend of Adrian's because Adrian, my co-editor, lives in Detroit. And she actually just finished a collection of short stories 
uh, science fiction short stories based in Detroit. And her story in the book, The River, is actually about, it's an anti-gentrification story set in Detroit, but it's a horror story. Um, so I'm not gonna give it away, but it's kind of awesome. Uh, and so she had known Tunde from organizing and from music, and so um, this was the first uh, piece of science fiction or fantasy that Tunde actually ever wrote as well. So when we reached out to folks, we really thought about people who, who we respected, people whose work we respected, both organizing um, and if they were doing creative work, and people we knew were good writers. Um, and so we felt like, you know, even if someone hadn't written science fiction, but if they had written nonfiction or they had written, they wrote lyrics and they were good at it, we're like, writing is writing, you understand editing, you understand, you know, you can learn, we feel like everyone can learn the skills of, um, fiction writing, uh, you know, we're not all gonna be Samuel Delaney, but, uh, but we can learn, um, but, <clears throat> so yeah, so that's, that's how we, so we reached out to folks. Is there anyone who you wanted for Octavia's brood that for some reason didn't work out that you'd recommend for us if we enjoyed Octavia's brood? Um, you, oh, you mean other writers? Yeah. Um, yeah, there were so many folks that we wanted um, who, who weren't able to, to participate. Um, I mean, and some, some folks who have written science fiction, um, not, you know, our focus was, again, more on organizers, activists, and change makers, so really trying to pull people who didn't um, write science fiction all the time. But we reached out to Nalo Hopkinson, who is amazing. Um, Midnight Robber, Brown Girl in the Ring. Uh, she does um, kind of uh, Caribbean-based magical realism. A lot of her main characters are, you know, young queer um, black women from the Caribbean. Um, Nettie Okorafor, we were hoping, um, could participate. She is an incredible um, Nigerian-American writer, uh, science fiction writer. Her book, Who Fears Death? It's a question. Who fears death? There's a question mark. So I just have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's set in post apocalyptic Sudan. Um, and her book, Akata Witch, I actually think every child should read that book because it it's just offers this powerful frame of, you know, shifting the things that people are told are their defects and saying this is actually where your magic comes from um, in this really powerful way. Um, yeah, I'm like, there are so many people. Um, Nisi Shaw, Andrea Harrison, Daniel Jose Older. Now I'm getting depressed. I'm like, oh, all these people that, but it's cool. It's cool, because they wrote other things and they're amazing, so, yes. Hi. Hi. Um, so uh, for, <laughs> for most of my life, I never really gave much attention or credit to sort of the sci-fi genre um, and when I did, I just sort of saw it as like, you know, quirky or interesting and, um, but nothing much more than that. I never really went deeper into it. And then I took a class called the biology of science fiction. And I was like, whoa, this is really important stuff. And sci-fi has been sort of like at the forefront of so many important like social political issues. Um, so I guess like, how do we get people to recognize the importance of this genre? Mm -hmm. I think that's a great question. And I think, I mean, I think it's, it's purposeful that science fiction is both marginalized, right, as, you know, it's genre literature, so it's, you know, it's in the corner with romance and westerns on the, those like turning racks that no one looks at. Um, and that when we think of science fiction, you know, the frame that we're given is, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's something to, you use to escape your normal life. I watch this so I can go somewhere else, I can turn off my brain, and I can just watch a story, right? And I think that that's purposeful, um, because I think that that, allow, that is a mechanism of social control. Because if science fiction and other fantastical genres are absolutely necessary for us to imagine different worlds, which would mean, you know, 
transforming the existing worlds and probably transforming the existing power structures, right? then science fiction and fantastical genres like it become incredibly dangerous to existing power structures. And so finding ways to marginalize it, minimalize it, finding ways to say, oh, it's, you know, it's just this fun escapist thing. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't look over there, right? These are not the droids you're looking for. Uh, talk about the Jedi Council too, y'all. Like, they're as bad as the Sith. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> So, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, uh, one, of, one of the amazing things that's happened with this collection um, that we had not expected, we expected that we would get um, people like us who lived at the intersections of nerdiness and social justice, right? And we imagined we, we might get our nerds as well who were like, I don't really know about social justice, but this is exciting. It's my nerd voice. And <laughs> but what we ended up with was so many people telling us this is the first science fiction I've ever read. I never I never thought it was important before. I mean some of our some of our contributors, in fact, were like, until I read Octavia Butler, I thought science fiction was ridiculous and a waste of time because I never saw anyone who looked like me in science fiction. I never saw the issues I dealt with, you know in science fiction and the way that I dealt with them. So, you know, I just was like, all right, that's not for me. And it, you know, I think um, encountering folks like Octavia Butler, folks were like, oh, actually that's really different. Um, but I think it's been really powerful to be folks' entry into science fiction. And we were like, this is a heavy mantle and responsibility, but we are up to the challenge. Hi there. Um, Can, where? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I was like. <laughs> um, yeah, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk you had like a rant about time travel. Um, I'm a big time travel fan. Love to hear some more. Oh, you know not what you do. <laughs> um, all right. So. I think, like the marginalization of science fiction being a mechanism of social control, I actually think one of the most brilliant mechanisms of social control is absolute linear time, right? First, I mean, the concept of time as it is, is a completely capitalist notion, right? Because we have to be able to divide it up, commodify it, and sell it, right? So we sell our time, and that's how we... Y'all, did you see that movie? What was it called? Timers? Is that what it's called? Something with, with, with Justin Timberlake. God bless. God bless. And they were, they, they literally like had a countdown on their arm and when they worked, they got more time on their counter, right? And, but when your counter ran out, when your clock ran out, then you died. And so people were, but like people were living literally second to second. Like they were like, yo, son, I got to buy, uh, can I borrow 20 minutes? Cause I got, my bus was late and I'm about, I've got, two minutes left, like literally I'm about to die right now and someone else would be like, I don't have 20 minutes to give you, right? It was, I mean, it was fascinating. Um, it was weird, Justin Timberlake was weird. It was weird to kind of try and be like, just don't think about that. And also, I mean, he lived in the, he lived in the hood and, and, and everyone in there, like 90% of them were white and I was like, really? <laughs> Huh, that's interesting. Justin Timberlake is the the hood hero then. All right, good to know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> this is why you don't start me on time because I'm like, okay, more about time. So, right, so linear, like this absolute linear time is a mechanism of social control, right? So if you if time only flows one way and you have no access to the past, you're completely cut off, and you have no access to the future because you can't know what's going to happen, then all you have is the present. So you might as well get whatever little comforts you can in the present, make the present as good as possible because the past is lost and the future is unknowable, right? I think that's a complete fallacy. Um, quantum physicists now think it's a complete fallacy. Quantum physicists are like, you guys, guess what? You'll never guess. Time is not linear. Time is not constant. Time and space are totally tied together. And time exists in multiple dimensions at the same time. And brown people are like, yes, yes, boo-boo, we know. 
We're glad you caught up though. Because I think when you look at cultures of color, you see their connection to time has always been very different, right? That time is actually more cyclical than linear, right? That time is not marked by this external kind of countdown, but that time is subjective um, and connected to us, right? Um, and there's a great, uh, very small collection called uh, Black Quantum Futurisms, Black Quantum Futurisms, that was edited by Rashida Phillips, that talks specifically about that in the context of uh, African cultures and taking specific African cultures, not like, you know, in Africa, <laughs> in that little country called Africa. Uh, but saying like, you know, in the Dogon culture, in the Igbo culture, you know, in, you know in, in, in these specific cultures, this is how time was thought of. And it has this really amazing chart where it shows that, you know, our, the, the kind of standard notion of time, the quantum physics notion of time, and then these uh, African cultures notion of time, which, you know, are basically, it, it's exactly what quantum physics is based on. Right. So I just, I think it's so, you know, I think that that's incredibly powerful because then it means that we are connected to the past and the future at the same time, right? And that we, you know, that we are not separated from them. And, you know, I think one thing that's, uh, this picture of Octavia, the reason we have, you know, these historic images around it is because Octavia was very clear that she was not the first person, A, to be writing work like this, certainly not the first person of color, and also B, yet that she came from a long lineage of sci-fi creators, right? And our, our framework is that if you come from a community that has been historically marginalized and oppressed, you are walking science fiction, right? Someone dreamed you up and then changed the entire world to bring you into existence. And so Adrian and myself as two black women think about that a lot. Think about our enslaved black ancestors in chains, dreaming of freedom at a time when they were told that was a complete impossibility. It was a fantasy. It would never happen, right? And these courageous, brilliant, innovative sci-fi creators said, well, then we're gonna dream our impossible dreams and we will change the entire world if necessary to make them reality. And that's exactly what they did. And so we very much feel like, you know, that, that Sankofa notion of moving forward while looking back, we can go back and get what we, what we lost, what we left behind, that that is very much a part of us. We are the culmination of that. Um, and then we have the right, the responsibility, and the privilege to dream new impossible dreams and to build those into existence. So future generations can, can look back and be like, wow, they, there was a time when people thought prisons were okay. Can you, can you even imagine that everyone was like, oh, it's cool, and then these brave, courageous folks we're like, no, we're gonna change the entire world, and they did that. And then those, you know, those generations are gonna have their own dreams to dream, to b bring into existence. Um, so I, I think that that notion of being able to reach into the future and reach into the past for what we need, we have everything we need. Um, and I think that, that that's a really important um, counter narrative to linear time. That was my long run. Okay, I was like, gonna, I was like, don't do it, don't do it. But I'm doing it. It's happening. Um, I, because I have to show Star Trek: Deep Space Nine. I just have to. I don't have to, but I'm going to. Um, okay, because I feel like, especially for Black folks, this this is so powerful. This episode, y'all. This episode. Whew, far beyond the stars. Who likes Deep Space Nine? Who are okay? All right. Who likes Star Trek in general? Okay, the rest of y'all, all right. <laughs> I'm gonna win you over. So, so in this episode, right, Star, Star Trek, Deep Space Nine, set in the 25th century, um, and Captain Sisko, who is uh, this man with the glasses, black man, is the commander, the captain of the space station in the 25th century. 
And then he ends up being transported back to the 1950s, where he is a character. He's he he is a science fiction writer, a black science fiction writer in Harlem in the 1950s. Benny Russell, who is writing a story about himself in the future, right? He's writing the story of Captain Cisco in the 25th century as this black commander of the spaceship. And um, he, so uh, Benny Russell, the sci-fi writer in the 1950s, but they're the same person, right? In the 1950s, um, wrote, wrote this story and submitted it to this, this sci-fi magazine in the 1950s. Uh, and you're about to see that sci-fi did not want a story about a black captain in, uh, in, the, 19, in the 25th century. It's about time. Douglas, magazine. There isn't any magazine, not this month anyway. Mr. Stone had the entire run pulped. He can't do that. Oh, he can, and he did. He believes, quote, this issue did not live up to our usual high standards, unquote. Oh, well, what's that supposed to mean? It means he didn't like it. Which means the public will simply have to get along without any incredible tales this month. What exactly is it that he did not like? The, the, the artwork, the, uh, the layout? Uh, what high standards is he talking about? Oh, I, it's about my story, isn't it? That's what this is all about. He didn't want to publish my story. And we all know why. Because my hero is a colored man. Hey, this magazine belongs to Mr. Stone. If he doesn't want to publish this month, we don't publish this month. End of story. And it doesn't make it right, and you know it. Don't tell me what I know. Besides, it's not about what's right. It's about what is. And I'm afraid I've got some more bad news for you, Benny. Mr. Stone has decided that your services are no longer required here. What? You're firing me? I have no choice, Benny. It's his decision. Well... You can't fire me. I quit. To hell with you. And to hell with Stone! Try to stay calm, Benny. Oh, I'm tired of being calm. Calm never got me a damn thing. I'm warning you, Benny, if, if you don't stop this, I'm going to call the police. You go ahead, call them. Call anybody you want. They can't do anything to me. Not anymore. And nor can any of you. Cisco exists. That future, that space station, all those people, they exist in here. In my mind, I created it. And every one of you know it. You read it. Oh. It's here. You, you, you hear what I'm... This is such a good part. <laughs> no. Think about what you've just seen, how powerful it is. Thinking about it. Okay, y'all ready? All right, it's just, uh, just a little break to let it sink in. Telling you, you can pop a story, but you cannot destroy an idea. Don't you understand? That's ancient knowledge. You cannot destroy an idea. That future, I created it, and it's real. Don't you understand? It is real. I created it, and it's real. It's real. Oh, God.
most easy for ever been. We have walked in the path of the prophets. There is no greater glory. Tell me, please, who am I? Don't you know? Tell me. You are the dreamer. And the dream. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I never know. Ah, oh, so good. You are the dreamer and the dream, right? And I feel like to have, and, and the character who played the preacher on the space station is Ben Sisko's father, right? So have this both, you know, black preacher as well as this father tell this black man, you are the dreamer and the dream, right? And, and I feel like it is just, this is all about challenging that notion of linear time, right? He's like, I created the future. I created, right, past tense. It's real. They exist. I made the future happen in the past, and it's already happening, and you can't stop it, right? And then he said, this is ancient knowledge. And I was like, you just said this is ancient knowledge. Uh, <laughs> You know, I just, I feel like he, you know, and um, this was this was one of those episodes where Avery Brooks had to fight his ass off to get, to get this in there, right? And, you know, to be able to talk about this in, you know, a black context as well. I mean, Benny, the reason he had a cane, Benny Russell was beaten by white police officers, right, in, this, in the streets. And so, you know, it was, it was so... Is so powerful, um, and I feel like it, it just epitomizes that when oppressed people are experiencing brutality, that it is, it is the future and the past coming together in the present that allows us to not only move forward, but to change the entire universe. So. I hope you're, you're not sorry you asked about time travel now. <laughs> Um, is there any other Hi, um, I was just wondering what, um, of all the various books and, I guess, movies and whatnot you've experienced in speculative fiction, um, what world you'd most like to live in? <laughs> that, that is a great question. Um, That is a really good question, because I'm like, yeah, there's so many amazing books, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to live there. No, no. <laughs> I was like, I love Octavia so much, but I don't want to live in her, one of her books. <laughs> Y'all, if you read it, her books are rough. You're like, ooh, this world is rough. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be contemplating that, but I do feel like, uh, off the top of my head, Marge Piercy's Woman on the Edge of Time, maybe because it was that kind of first time that I saw some of these things I was thinking about actually in practice, um, and was like, oh, that's what that could look like. Um, yeah. So this is just a little question. Um, I don't know if there have been any films made of uh, Octavia's books, but if, if there haven't, um, how do you think movie makers would deal with uh, what is in her books, and how do you think they would either bring out her essential ideas or castrate them or turn them on their heads? Yeah, I mean, uh, they're actually working on a um, TV series based on her book Kindred now. Or, I mean, not Kindred, sorry, on uh, Xenogenesis, which is about uh, alien invasion, basically. Um, and to say I am worried <laughs> is a huge understatement, because I think, again, I mean, there. It, Octavia's work is so nuanced and it is so much about those principles and values in it. And I think it's really easy to focus on, you know, on the aliens or even just like, oh, and here are the brown people, rather than saying, but it's really the heart of this is is the struggle. Um, you know, Octavia in the clip I couldn't show you, she said that 
um, so much of her work is about power because she feels powerless so much of her life. And she's like, this is about power, what people do with it when they get it, what they do to get it, what we could do with it. Uh, and she says, you know, that we are very intelligent, but oftentimes our intelligence serves our hierarchical tendencies as humans, and we tend to one-up ourselves to death. I feel like that framework is something that has to be foundational in anything about her work. Um, the movie rights to Kindred have been bought. Kindred is a time travel story where a black woman in 1976 is pulled back in time to the antebellum slave period by, one of, by her white ancestor, who is a slave owner. Uh, he didn't know he was doing it, and he's a little boy, and he's basically dragging her through time back and forth. Um, and there is a graphic novel that's actually being drawn uh, by John Jennings, who did our cover of Kindred as well. And if you go to John's pages or his social media, you can see the images from Kindred, and it's so intense and powerful. I like, wanted to scratch the screen when I saw some of the characters. I'm like, oh, I hate you. I'm like, all right, hold it together, hold it together. Um, yeah, but I mean, I think, you know, uh, there was a instance where when Ursula Le Guin's uh, series Earthsea got made into a miniseries on the Sci-Fi Channel. I don't know if you saw that. I would not recommend you watch it. And Ursula Le Guin does not recommend you watch it. She was pissed, y'all. And she wrote this open letter that was basically like, y'all done fuck my book up, right? And, uh, you know, and so in, in the book, the vast majority of the characters are people of color. In the movie, there's only one black person, and he's the servant to the main character, right? And she was like, yeah, no. <laughs> like, um, and she, you know, she, she, you know, I think that that's such an obvious example. But you know, I mean, that was just made within the last few years, and so that's something so clear. Where she very clearly in the book describes her characters as people of color again and again. They just took that out. Um, and in the Sci-Fi Museum in Seattle, they have a letter from, I think it's 1975, about the cover to Earthsea that she wrote to our publisher. Ursula Le Guin has just always kept it real, y'all. So she wrote this letter to our publisher, and it's like, you know, it's typewritten, it's on a typewriter, because it's 1975, and she's like, I have seen the new cover that you sent me for this version of Earthsea. I don't know how else to say it, but my ca main character is brown. And then it says, brown, brown, <laughs> all caps. She clearly went back and retyped over it, brown. <laughs> she was like, what else do I need to do to make you understand this? Um, so yeah, so I just, <laughs> I just love that she like went, she clearly went back and was like, no, I'm serious about this brown thing, y'all. So, um, yes, one more. Um, what classes will you be teaching at PSU if you're teaching any for this coming spring quarter? Uh, yes, I am. I'm actually teaching the history of the Black Panther Party in spring. Um, and then next fall, I will be teaching race and the history of prisons. And in winter, I will be teaching race and science fiction. So you can come nerd out with me if you guys want. Um, so thank you all so much for having me. Thank you again to all the sponsors, all the folks who made this possible. Uh, thank you so much.